Welcome to Tea with Erping. As China becomes increasingly aggressive in asserting its power through infiltration and coercion, it forgoes its long-time effort to create a positive image. The world awakens at the fact that this party state now believes it's better to be feared. The Institute for Strategic Studies of French Military Schools, a French military think tank, released a report on September 20, analyzing China's influence operations around the world in great detail, and has brought the attention of many world leaders who have then formed a strategic partnership to counter China's infiltration and supremacy on the global stage. Back in November 2018, Stanford's Hoover Institution produced a thorough report on China's infiltrations in the U.S. It's called China's Influence and American Interests, Promoting Constructive Vigilance. But this French report is, however, much more extensive, as it covers Beijing's infiltrations around the world. Today I will talk about this French report given its well-researched information, and yet, it hasn't been, in my opinion, adequately covered by the international press. China's influence operations Marquis Valley moment is written by Jean-Baptiste Jingen Wilmer, Dean of the French Military Academy's School of Strategic Studies, and Paul Caron, an intelligent Chinese expert with credentials from Harvard and China's Tsinghua University. The 650-page report is probably the most extensive analysis of China's propaganda machine ever published in French, revealing actions and conceptions used by Beijing to manipulate Western opinions with the ultimate goal to be the world's largest power, and imposing China's own model, communist hegemony, to the world. The report has specifically mentioned the People's Liberation Army 311 military base in Fujian province, also known as Unit 61716 that is committed to implementing the Three Warfare Strategy, mobilizing all the Chinese institutions to promote the Three Warfares, which are 1. Public Opinion Warfare, designed to shape the minds of the general public. Second, Psychological warfare designed to target the enemy's morale and demoralize its citizens. 3. Legal warfare designed to use all legal systems to prevent enemy's attacks. These three warfares together constitute China's key strategy of non-armed, non-contact confrontation to win the war on the free world, thereby creating an environment favorable to the communist regime restricting the enemy's freedom of movement and the right to speak, with the goal of consolidating the party state's ruling power. In the public opinion warfare, various media are exploited to enhance Beijing's political messaging, with the involvement in content production. Disinformation, propaganda, and aggressive influence strategies formulated by the Communist Party all media and digital platforms such as TikTok, WeChat, Weibo, Baidu and Huawei must cooperate with the Base 311, an IT troll army of at least 2 million full-time and 20 million part-time Chinese citizens, almost equivalent to the population of Taiwan, is mobilized to spread Chinese propaganda and flood social networks to manipulate issues such as the COVID-19 epidemic and inciting hyper hatreds against Hong Kong activists and other political as well as religious dissidents. Psychological warfare is used to break down the enemy's morale, deter, confuse, and even intimidate the enemy, thereby weakening the enemy's will to fight. Such roles in manipulating and influencing the world present a grave national security threat for the free world. A full set of psychological warfare methods, including arbitrary arrests, mass detentions, re-education through labor camps, brainwashing of children, and the destruction of religious sites. These are some of the examples used by the Communist Party against underground churches, Tibetans, Falun Gong, and more recently against the Uyghurs in Xinjiang, where the largest scale detention centers have been built since World War II. Forced sterilization and abortion are imposed on Uyghur women to suppress the ethnic population. This French report states that in the past decade, Beijing has tried to influence at least 10 elections in seven countries. Several attacks are launched to disrupt the election process, 
hackers and bots spread disinformation through social media platforms and foreign local media outlets were bought out to collaborate and coordinate with Beijing. Huayi Broadcasting Corporation CHBC, was founded by the People's Liberation Army and is the most commonly used disguised identity for Base 311. CHBC states its goal is to promote Chinese culture and unite compatriots. However, the French report reveals that through CHBC, Beijing has been spreading fake news and waging public opinion wars in the 2018 Taiwan elections. More recently, China has built up tensions over Taiwan Strait, with numerous jet fighters only to impose its imminent invasion of the island. One of the psychological warfare goals is to sow distrust and to obstruct decision-making for the enemies. In the legal warfare, China's appeal for market access, trade, and investment opportunities has also become its major source of coercive power. Economic coercion, particularly denying market access to foreign investors, imposing embargoes and tariffs, and organizing boycotts is a cause of growing concern. Last year, China imposed major trade restrictions on Australian goods, after Australia called for an inquiry into COVID-19, a number of Western companies were boycotted after expressing concern over the false labor cotton production in Xinjiang, with H&M being the main target. The Chinese government's message is clear. Anyone who offends the Chinese people should prepare to pay the price, as bluntly stated by China's foreign ministry spokeswoman Hua Chunying. This kind of global and systemic influence, though deployed differently across the globe, points to Beijing's objective to be the most prominent country in the world. On one hand, Beijing uses positive narratives to win the favor of some countries. On the other, infiltration, manipulation, blurring the line between economic cooperation and the pressures of economic coercion. Reuters reported that China's Institutes of Contemporary International Relations, a think tank affiliated with China's intelligence agency, warns its communist leaders that global anti-China sentiment was at its highest since the 1989 Tiananmen Square massacre. The rise of wolf warrior diplomacy has rendered regular diplomatic channels with China ineffective, as Chinese officials have taken the opportunity to publicly dress down their global counterparts. During the bilateral talks with China's diplomats this March, U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said, a confident country is able to look hard at its own shortcomings and constantly seek to improve. China has invested $1.52 billion every year since 2008 to better control its image in the world. But the public perceptions and attitudes towards China today has declined dramatically. The party state has chosen to employ wolf warrior tactics, as they now believe it's safer to be feared than to be loved. The French report notes that Taiwan Hong Kong constitute the first front of Beijing's political war. They are the R&D laboratories of China's operations, which can then be refined and applied to other targets around the world. The first step of expansion focuses on Australia and New Zealand. The second phase focuses on the rest of the world, especially Europe and North America. Sweden became China's laboratory in Europe. Beijing used a Chinese tourist incident to incite boycott for Swedish travel and Swedish brands such as IKEA and Volvo. Sweden was the first Western country to establish diplomatic relations with the Communist China in 1950. China uses psychological warfare to suppress Sweden's call for the release of Mr. Gui Minhai, a Chinese-born Swedish citizen who has been detained in China since 2015 after publishing books critical of Beijing. The European Union has officially branded China as a systemic rival. Australia, India, Japan, and the United States have revitalized the Quad grouping of nations committed to a free and open Indo-Pacific region that is undaunted by coercion. The US, the UK, and Australia decided to form a strategic partnership implicitly aimed at countering China's growing influence in Asia. It seems to me China's biggest enemy is the Communist Party itself. Beijing's aggressive wolf warrior diplomacy could only backfire, and its unpopularity may indirectly weaken the party in the future, 
including facing its own people. Based on this French report, it seems that the Communist Party's methods of slandering and persecuting Falun Gong is an example of application of the three warfares. Falun Gong is a Buddhist meditation with the principles of truthfulness, compassion, and tolerance, which has attracted tens of millions of followers, including high-level communist officials. The Communist Party initially endorsed Falun Gong for seven years because of its health benefits. But later, the party realized that Falun Gong's popularity and teachings are at odds with the communist ideology, much in the same way as other religious beliefs. So the atheist Communist Party changed its mind in 1999 and started to suppress it with lies and propaganda. On June 10, 1999, the former party leader Jiang Zemin established the notorious Sixth Office for the purpose of coordinating and implementing the persecution of Falun Gong. The Sixth Office has approximately 15,000 members, domestic and abroad. They are given the authority to eliminate Falun Gong without any legal basis, and no measures are seen to be excessive. Chen Yonglin, former diplomat at the Chinese Consulate General in Sydney, Australia, detailed the methods used by Chinese authorities to detect, monitor, and persecute Falun Gong practitioners around the world. Chen confirmed that in the year 2000, Beijing relied on 1,000 spies and informants in Australia for the surveillance and persecuting of Falun Gong members. The Chinese Consulate General in Sydney established a special anti-Falun Gong team personally led by Consul General. Similar organizations have been established in the United States and other countries where Falun Gong is present. In every CCP diplomatic mission, there must be at least one official in charge of Falun Gong issues who will investigate and file Falun Gong practitioners on the blacklist and prevent them from returning to China. These organizations undertake large-scale publicity to foreign governments and elected officials, and use different media and institutions to lead the public to believe in the legitimacy of Beijing's persecution and its disinformation about Falun Gong. Supporting Communist Party members in universities are instigated to openly oppose and slander Falun Gong, and funding is given to specifically counter Falun Gong activities in China and abroad. Worse still, false organ harvesting from Falun Gong prisoners has been in practice on a massive scale since 2000. In the face of such a crime against humanity, the U.S. Congress and European Parliament has both passed resolutions condemning this modern-day atrocity. The world has yet to take any concrete action to stop it. Developing soft power has been a pillar of Chinese foreign policy since 2007 and continues to be part of China's long-term policy orientation. Following the report released by the French military think tank, the French Senate released a special report on October the 5th entitled Impact of Countries Outside of Europe, revealing how Beijing used Confucius Institutes to influence French universities and academia. China has independently, or in cooperation with the universities, established Confucius Institutes worldwide to promote its political agenda in the name of teaching the Chinese language. The French Senate puts forward a recommendation to raise the topic of foreign interference to political priority because the presence of such institutes threatened the academic freedom of its partners and even harbor spies. China's influence operations overseas constitute serious interference in these countries. From the perspective of Western philosophy, Machiavellianism means that to consolidate power, one should not be bound by any moral code and should do anything it takes to achieve its goals. I say a Berlin of a political theorist and philosopher described one applying such ideology, a man inspired by the devil to lead good men to their doom, the great subverter, the teacher of evil. All politics is local, all foreign policies are domestically driven. There are multiple social and economic problems facing the communist leadership, rising costs of living, widening income gap, inflation, power shortages, real estate collapse, lack of fundamental freedoms, the hopeless conditions for millennials, and the power struggle within the Communist Party all contribute to challenging the legitimacy of the communist government. 
Historically, China has never been this aggressive globally, as this wolf warrior diplomacy is incompatible or at odds with its 5,000 year culture traditions and Confucian norms. Today's China is run by a communist regime that was founded with a foreign ideology, which carries the mission to ultimately liberate and globalize the world with communism. This is why it's imperative to distinguish the Chinese Communist Party from the 1.4 billion Chinese people and their culture. The CCP doesn't represent the Chinese people, nor its civilization. International partnership with such a regime is in fact sustaining and lending legitimacy to such a dictatorship, a threat not only to the well-being of the Chinese people, but also to that of the world. Decades of constructive engagement policy along with the economic cooperation with this regime has only witnessed that this red dragon is now strong enough to turn around, biting the very hand that has been feeding this beast. Despite being the second largest economy, the communist regime will face the inevitable collapse sooner perhaps than most people have anticipated. Both Buddhism and Taoism believe in karmic retribution. French writer Voltaire once said, I've never made but one prayer to God, a very short one, O Lord, make my enemies ridiculous, and God granted it. With that, let's have a tea break. Until next time, peace and tea be with you.